tell you what. <laughs> if I can't preach after that, there's no hope. What a wonderful, wonderful service. God's Spirit is here. You are here. Let's take our Bibles and open together to a seldom read passage. We read it last week. This week we'll definitely get through the message. Leviticus 23, 24. And then for later, we'll go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, 13 through 18. Leviticus 23, 24. Without preaching too much as I read through this, this time compared to last week, we'll still make a few comments. Say to the Israelites, in other words, we are supposed to remind each other. The Israelites are God's people. Through faith in Jesus Christ, we are God's people. So we are to be saying this to each other. This is a reminder. On the first day of the seventh month, that's the Hebrew month Tishri, which corresponds to September, mm, October. This year, 2020, it's going to be on September the 18th. Now we have another name for it. The Jews, the modern Jewish world has another name for this. It's called Rosh Hashanah, which means the head of the year, the beginning of the Jewish New Year, the civil New Year, if you will. So on the first day of the seventh month, you are to have a day of rest. Very simply, that's Sabbath. You are to have a Sabbath, regardless of what day it falls on. By the way, uh, first day of the seventh month of Tishri this year, 2020, is on the Sabbath. It begins sundown Friday, September 18th. Keep that in your head. It says, you are to have a day of rest, a sacred assembly, okay? That's kadosh mikra in the Hebrew, a sacred assembly, commemorated, or the King James here, memorial, celebrated with trumpet blasts. Now, let me read one verse out of 1 Thessalonians 4. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with a voice of the archangel, and the trumpet call of God. And the dead in Christ will rise. May God add his blessings to the reading of his word. I'm going to try my best not to cover what I covered last week because I really want to talk about the significance of the trumpet call of God. So I'll go through this as quickly as I can. This is one of the seven Hebrew feasts, high days, holy convocation, or high Sabbaths. I'm not going to walk through those seven again as I did last week. This one is known <laughs> as the Feast of Trumpets. And there is, there is a fulfillment for each one of these. Jesus Christ will fulfill each of these seven high holy days. He has already done the first four. He will do the last three. The first four are spring celebrations. The last three, beginning with the Feast of Trumpets or Yom Teruah, the day of the trumpet. It is the first of the three fall feasts or actually one was more of a fast than a feast. And Jesus Christ has yet, but will fulfill these. I've said it before, I've said it again, God always acts according to his divine calendar. But here's the question. What is the meaning of the trumpet call of God? What does it signal? Now, last week, I shared with you the first one. We said, first of all, it is a call to remember. What is it a call to remember? Well, by sounding the trumpet, they are remembering a previous sounding of the trumpet. 
which if you go back in Exodus, and we're not going to look at that Exodus, we're not going to look at that again, but if you do, it talks about the trumpet blast that took place on Mount Sinai. It doesn't say where the trumpet came from. As a matter of fact, one gets the, one gets the sense that the sound of the trumpet did not come from the Hebrews blowing the shofar. But rather there were rumblings and there were thunder and there was lightning and there was smoke and the Bible says of trumpet blasts or trumpets that were blaring. And one gets the sense that this was a heavenly trumpet, the trumpet call of God. So what this calls the good people of God to remember was the first time they met God. Now you've got to remember this. Even though they'd been in slavery for 400 years, and even though they'd been delivered by delivered in slavery, and there were these ten curses that came upon Egypt and or plagues or whatever you want to call them, and even though they'd been delivered through the midst of the Red Sea and all these wonderful things, they had been delivered by God's hand. These people did not know God. I want you to get this in your head. You will never meet anyone that God is not working in their life. You don't have to know God for Him to work in your life. He's working in your life whether you know it or not. But on that particular day, Moses had said, here's what I want you to do. I, I want to give you two days to get ready. Two days to get ready to meet God. And we talked about this some last week. What does it mean to get ready to meet God. For example, today, did you get ready to meet God? The Bible says in another place in Amos, uh, let's see if I wrote this down anywhere, I may not remember. Amos 4.12. In the prophet Amos, he has a message to the people of Israel, and he says, prepare to meet your God. It is God's reminder that we are called to meet with Him. It's also a reminder of something else. It's a reminder of the very first Sabbath. That God created the world and everything in it, and behold, it was very good. And then God rested on the Sabbath day. That was the first Sabbath day. So, on the first day of the seventh month of Tishri, we blow the trumpet to remind God's people of what? Remind that God created the world. Remind that God rested on the seventh day, that's to say he finished his creating work and that we are to keep it holy unto him and it's also a reminder that we are to meet with our God. It's interesting to me, now I understand people being gone for holidays I really do, God knows I've been gone on my share of them as well but hear this whenever I've been gone for a holiday I never forget the holy day if I'm not here in church, I am somewhere in church. Okay? And we have people that let me know that we're not going to be there uh, for Labor Day weekend. We're going to be gone to see family and whatnot. I get that. I totally get that. And I'm fine with that. All right? But I am so glad. I really did not expect this number today. Really did not. I thought, man, we'll be, we'll be good to have half of one side filled today. This is great. This is wonderful to see you here. But I just want you to know that we have too many holidays and not enough holy days. Amen. So the first one. What is the meaning of the trumpet call of God? It's a call to remember God. A call to remember Him. Number two, what is it? Number two, it is a call to reverence. A call to reverence God. Not just remember Him. But to reverence God, to see Him as holy, someone to be heard, someone to obey. The Bible says, not only is it to be a day of rest and remembering, but it's to be a, yours to have a sacred assembly. The Hebrew is Kodesh Mikra. It means holy, consecrated, but here's the thing. It's a public assembly. We're to reverence God in our coming together in a public assembly. Some people say, well, Pastor Dan, you preachers make far too much of coming together as a church. You know, why can't we just stay home and watch you on 
the computer or watch you on our TV. Why can't we just do that? Because you are forsaking part of what our call is. We are called to assemble together. Matter of fact, the word church, the word church in the Greek is ekklesia, which means the called out ones, the assembled ones. The word church means assembly. You understand, you can be a child of God, you can be a Christian, yes. But you are not the church unless you're gathered with two or three or more. But if two or three are gathered by name, near my the midst of that. It's an assembly. The Bible says, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together, as the manner of some is, but yet rather to encourage one another daily, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. What's the day approaching? The return of Jesus Christ. We need to be together more, not less. I don't care about COVID-19. I don't care what the governor says, the president says, or anybody says. We need to be together more, not less. Amen. My, my Spanish-speaking friends call their churches, many of them, Asambleas, or Asambleas del Dios, Assemblies of God, comes from the same word that we're looking at here, a sacred assembly commemorated with trumpet blasts. You see, the trumpet was blown to signal the worship of God and to reverence Him. It was a call to prayer. This call to prayer sounded uh, four times every day, but three times every day, when this trumpet was blown, it called God's people to the temple to pray. Nine o'clock, noon, and 3 p.m. Those were the hours of prayer for the Jews. It's a call to prayer. It's a call to meet God. It's a call to reverence Him. What are the first words of the Lord's Prayer? Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your name is holy. And so we take time out of our day, and the Jews did it three times a day to, a, to assemble together and address the holiness of God. Do you realize that Jesus prayed from the cross each of those times? At nine o'clock, when he was nailed, nine o'clock in the morning when they nailed him to the cross, what did he do? He prayed. He said, Father, forgive them because they don't know what they do. And then at noon, what did he pray? He said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Because in that moment, he was made to be sin for us. God cannot look upon sin. And for the only moment in all eternity, God the Son became sin for us. And God could not fellowship with his own Son. And for the only time in all authority, Jesus did not know fellowship with the Father because our sin was placed upon Him, separating Him from the Father. That was at noon. And then at 3 o'clock that afternoon, He prayed. And He said, Father, into Your hands I commend My Spirit. The trumpet call of God is a call to worship, a call to prayer, a call to reverence. And then, this would go on for 10 days. It was more a time of fasting than feasting. I told you that today they celebrate this period by eating apples dipped in honey, and I'm not going to go into all that again. But primarily, it was a time of fasting more than feasting. They call it the 10 days of awe. And for 10 days, the people of God would repent of their sins. And that says a lot about you when it takes 10 days to repent of all your sins. <laughs> There's also a time when gifts were given to the poor, when people went to one another and sought forgiveness, and forgiveness was also rendered to those that asked. Let me say this to you as a church. We don't do enough of that. We get our feelings hurt. Some of you listening to this, I hope you're listening. I hope you're watching. We get our feelings hurt. We quit coming to church. 
somebody in the church says something we don't like either to our face or on Facebook or somewhere else and we get our feelings hurt and we don't come because we don't want to face them. We don't want to see them. We don't want to look at them. You know what it really is? We don't want to forgive them. Or we don't want to ask them to forgive us. Is there anybody, is there anybody that you know whose forgiveness you need to see? Is there anyone you know whom you need to go to them and say, I'm sorry, forgive me. Or to go to them and say, I forgive you. That's what the trumpet means. It's a call to repentance. Now there, this would end with the Day of Atonement. And the Day of Atonement was the holiest day of all. Because at that day, sacrifice was made for the sins of God's people. And the blood was poured out upon the mercy seat. And God's people were redeemed. And they said, well, Pastor, did Jesus already do that? Yes. But you understand that all have not received it yet. Especially the people of God, the people of Israel. And there will be, according to the word of God, one third of all Israel will eventually be saved. And the Jews are turning to Jesus Christ faster and greater, more than ever and ever. Yeah. They're coming to Jesus. So the Day of Atonement is drawing nigh. But leading up to that was a time of repentance. Number three, it is a call to repentance. The Day of Trumpets was a time of warning. You know, we're used to, we don't see it, but how many of you miss a football? Mm -hmm. I'm full of this. They had a college football game on yesterday. I didn't care who they were. But uh, actually, I hope it's golf yesterday. But football, right? We have what happens in football? We have the two minute warning. Ladies and gentlemen, I submit to you that the two minute warning is sounding. I'm not saying it's two actual minutes. But the, the trumpet blast of God is a warning. It's a warning of coming judgment, it's a warning to sound the alarm. Remember this, there is no salvation, no forgiveness without repentance. Turn with me, if you will, now that you won't see the word repent here, but turn with me, if you will, to Joel chapter 2. Joel chapter 2. Joel chapter 2 talks about the prophet. By the way, prophet Joel is powerful, powerful book. Uh, this probably this this uh, book of Joel. I found this out yesterday. My nephew, by the way, who is a preacher, he's five years younger than me. He's a pastor uh, down in Florida. He's going to be preaching tonight in Knoxville, Tennessee. But uh, uh, I found out that the the passage that led to his salvation and his calling in ministry was Joel. But Joel chapter two, beginning verse fifteen. Blow the trumpet in Zion. Declare a holy fast. Call a sacred assembly. Again, Kodesh Mikra. Gather the people. Consecrate the assembly. In other words, get them ready. Bring together the elders. Gather the children, those nursing at the breast. Light, let the bed, bridegroom leave his room in the bridal chamber. In other words, Nobody's left out. Everybody's included. No excuses for this. Let the priests who minister before the Lord weep between the temple porch and the altar. Let them say, spare your people, O Lord. Do not make your inheritance an object of scorn, a byword among the nations. In other words, God, don't let, don't let us be a, a past thing. Why should they say among the peoples, where is their God? You know, I believe more and more in America right now, we're hearing that question, where is God? Where is their God? Well, I can certainly tell you places that uh, he's questioned. I'm not going to say that God isn't there, but I am going to say there's lots of places that God is not acknowledged in our country right now. And I'll leave that up to you to figure out who I'm talking about. 
Verse 18, that the Lord will be jealous for his land and take pity on his people. The Lord will reply to them, I am sending you grain, new wine, and oil, enough to satisfy you fully. Never again will I make you an object of scorn for the nation. But before that, he calls to God's people and he says, I'm going to give you a warning. I'm warning you. I'm warning you. There is judgment coming. Yes, there will be a future restoration. Yes, there will be future blessing. But there will not be that unless there is repentance. Jesus preached it. Jesus preached it. You go to the next slide now. Jesus preached it. Matthew, let me, Matthew 4, 17. From that time on, Jesus began to preach, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. And then in Mark 1, 15, the time is coming, said, the kingdom of God is near. Repent and believe the good news. And then two times in Luke's gospel, he said, except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. There is no salvation. There is no forgiveness without repentance. And the trumpet calls us to repentance. In Luke 15, 7, I love that one. The, you know, we know this is the parable of the lost sheep. Jesus, at the very end of that story, says, I tell you, in the same way, there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. I think I see a little humor in that statement. Maybe a little irony in that statement. 99 just persons. Where are they? Who does God rejoice over? God rejoices over those who repent. Then you got the great servant of Pentecost. When 3,000 people got saved in one day. It says, when the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you. Now, baptism wasn't in order to be saved, but it was something you did to give evidence of your salvation. So if you receive Jesus Christ as Lord and save your life, and you need to be baptized. You haven't been baptized as yet. Uh, remember, it is, it is a way of saying, you know, I've accepted Jesus, and I'm not going to let anything get in the way of people knowing I've accepted Jesus, so I'm going to follow him in believer's baptism because he told me to do it. And that should be reason enough. But he says, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and that's really the cause of the forgiveness of your sins. And you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now you can have the gift of the Holy Spirit and not be water baptized. But if you know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior and you're not been water baptized, I submit it's the first act of obedience of a new believer. And I ask you to do that. The word repent means to turn, have a change of heart, a change of mind, a change of action to return last week. I didn't, I didn't do it again this week. I even put it on our Calvary members' website or Facebook page so you can see it. But there is an event in Washington, D.C. on September the 26th of this year. At the mall, it's a Saturday. It'll be at the mall. Think about this. It's going to be on the Sabbath. At the mall. And it's going to be, yes, it's going to be during that time of the of the 10 days of awe, that call to repentance. And it's called the return. And they're asking Christians to pray. And they're asking Christians to repent. And they're asking Christians to pray that God would send revival to our nation. Because listen to this. Listen to me clearly. I think it's important that we vote as believers. But do not trust in your vote. Do not trust in politics. Do not trust in politicians. Do not trust in this election to save this country. Amen. Do not trust in a person to save this country. Amen. There's only one who can save this country, and that's God. Amen. That's all. So that's why it's important. That, by the way, I got a letter, a letter in my office that came this week from Franklin Graham announcing again the September 26th there will be a prayer march. It's called a prayer march in in Washington, D.C. So God has led him and other independent Christian thinkers and leaders to all gather on the same day. 
during the ten days of all. Yom Teruah, the Feast of Trumpets in Washington, D.C. to repent and seek God for revival. Let me ask you, do you think that is a coincidence? I think not. And by the way, you can watch it online. Mark it on your calendar, Saturday, the 26th of September. Whatever you do on Saturday, forget it. Find out where it's going on. Find the website. I think the website is called uh, thereturnwebsite.org. I think I, I even posted that somewhere, thereturnwebsite.org. And you can go on and stream it. You can watch it, and you can participate that way. But Malachi chapter 3, verse 7 says, Ever since the time of your forefathers, you have turned away from my decrees and have not kept them. Return to me, and I will return to you, says the Lord Almighty. That's the scripture for the return. The return. So it's not only a, not only a signal or a call to repent. It's a signal to return. It's a call to number four, revival. Revival, if you're filling in the blanks. And I quoted this earlier, Second Corinthians, or Second Chronicles, excuse me, seven fourteen. You know it, most of you know it by heart. Would you say with me? If my people, who are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and will heal their land. We quoted it so much, I think we've almost lost its meaning. But that really is something, folks, we need to respond to. We need to be called a revival. We need to have revival, the kind that changes us, the church, from the inside out. I'm not talking about a series of meetings with a preacher droning on every night. I'm not talking about that. And I'm talking about the work that only God can do, only God can do when he takes that which is dead and makes it alive again. Uh, you know, I, I carry a daily reminder of that with me everywhere I go. And then maybe somebody else in here has the same thing. But in my, in my chest, I carry what's called an implanted, implanted cardio diverter defibrillator, which if my heart stops beating, or gets out of sync too much, it will fire and hopefully get me back in sinus rhythm and save my life. Revive <coughs> I carry within my own chest that which can lead to revival. And ladies and gentlemen, so do you. In your heart, you have the person of the Holy Spirit. And if you just ask, if you just seek, if you just genuinely humble yourself and repent before Almighty God, you can have revival. Our nation can have revival. And boy, do we need it. Number five. This is where we get a little bit where there might be some disagreement. But I want you to know that I am not going to preach a particular view of the second coming of Jesus Christ. However, what is the purpose of the trumpet? The trumpet is a call for the return of the Savior and the resurrection of the saints. <coughs> Go with me now to that scripture that drives us crazy, depending on your point of view of the second coming of Christ. 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18. Open your Bibles, please. 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18. Brothers, we do not want you to be ignorant. Now I like what uh, I like what J. Vernon McGee says about this. In the King James it says, Now I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren. So what does J. Vernon McGee say? J. Vernon McGee says, Don't be one of the ignorant brethren. <laughs> So, we don't have to be ignorant about the things of the second coming of Jesus Christ. Let me say that right off the bat. We're told not to be. So what does he say? We don't want you to be ignorant about those who fall asleep. In other words, those who are already dead. Or to grieve like the rest of men who have no hope. We believe. Now here it is. We believe 
that Jesus died and rose again. And so, we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. So what is one of the earmarks of the trumpet call of God? The trumpet call of God says Jesus will return, and so also will those who have been absent in body but present with the Lord. So without a glorified body, those who have died and are present with the Lord, they will return with him, and they will be reunited within what is a changed, glorified body. You may say, what about those that got eaten by sharks and, and whatever? Okay? What about those that were burned or uh, incinerated? What about those people that uh, decided, you know, they didn't want to spend a lot of money on their funeral, so they just got cremated? Well, that's, there's an easy answer to that. Dust you are, and dust you'll return. One just gets you there faster. <laughs> and if God can create you out of dust, He can recreate you out of dust. <laughs> so hopefully that settles some questions you may have had about some of those things. So we believe that Jesus died and rose again, so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in Him. Then notice verse 15. According to the Lord's own word. In other words, Paul said, listen, I didn't get this by reading the late great planet Earth. I didn't get this by reading somebody's book about the rapture or the second coming. He says, I got this directly from Jesus. We tell you that we who are still alive, who are left till the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. 